You know, it's been exactly one year since my ultimate Five Nights at Freddy's retrospective, where I came to realize that I was actually a fan of the series, and since then... Yeah, the obsession hasn't faded. Despite there being no game releases from the time of my last video in the series until now, I still actively keep up with the franchise, whether it be from streaming the games on my Twitch, buying the merchandise, and checking in now and then to see what the fanbase is up to. And it appears what they're currently up to is pulling their hair out over the release of the next game in the series, Security Breach, which has suffered from delay after delay. With us still having no idea when it's coming out and updates being extremely slow. I mean, we basically only have one gameplay trailer so far, and it barely even shows us anything. I don't know if it's just me, but this trailer has me quite worried. The gameplay looks super bare bones. I really hope it isn't just a walking simulator with things happening around you, like a visual novel, but I'm looking forward to being proven wrong when it releases. And the comment section to tear me apart for criticizing it just there now. But come on, Matt, don't ask why my mouth isn't moving anymore. I need something to hold me over. These games just to come out like every four months. Now we're waiting over two years? There's gotta be something akin to Five Nights at Freddy's I can play. If only there were like millions and millions of games like FNAF that I could check out. Maybe even some featuring other franchises I like such as Sonic the Hedgehog. And you know, preferably very amateur ones. Don't want anyone upstaging the real Scott Cawthon now, would we? Wait, can I still say that name? Oh god, I'm so out of the loop. Hmm. If only there was someone I knew who really liked Five Nights at Freddy's. Preferably a YouTuber. Someone who makes tons and tons of videos about the franchise. Holy smokes, I have absolutely no idea where I just teleported to. <laughs> Oh hey, that's Mark from YouTube.com. Well, so you can quit it with that joke already, we get it. Hey, no YouTube.com slash GoMotion aka Jody. I'm not getting breeded on my own channel, you're on my turf now. Well, uh, alright then, I guess if you don't want my vast knowledge of the FNAF fanverse. Fine, but you only get four or five jabs. <laughs> Deal. So, Five Nights at Freddy's, the hit game franchise that entered the indie horror scene in mid 2014. While it's definitely received its fair share of mixed and controversial opinions over the years for appearing to be nothing beyond a jump scare rich screen first at surface level, has been lauded for what it does do to shake things up and bring what unique elements it can to the table. What the games may individually lack in polish, gameplay variation, and uh, not unnecessarily overcomplicating its own lore, do build a stronger case for existing as the smash hit the series is in its simplicity. Whether it's the breadcrumbs scattered across the first few entries that are presented as nothing more than bare-bones minigames doing their damned best to replicate that good old classic Atari vibe or feeding the player just enough audio and visual information in order to get them to scramble together a strategy to survive, what Five Nights at Freddy's does do well at arguably freaking nails, with the most notable example straight up being the core gameplay itself. You can definitely tell where the budget goes for each entry in the series, and while here and there the rough sides do show, incorporating each mechanic, audio, and visual elements into these games, modeling, animating, building the story behind the spook-ridden gameplay of them, is really what gives the classic FNAF formula its well-deserved and standout identity in the ever-growing sea of indie horror titles. Even if at the end of the day it is all just thrown in click team and exported across the span of only a couple weeks. Hmm, so what you're saying is anyone can make a Five Nights at Freddy's? No, I literally said the exact opposite of that. Alright, I already have my new game ready. Five Nights at Timmy Turner's. Oh, look at that, I'm a millionaire now. Yeah, I don't think that's how it works, Mog. Well, I don't know, I couldn't have been the only person to have this idea. Just search up FNAF fan game and watch your computer struggle to load the millions of results. I'm not sure if people wanted to cash in on the success of the series, got some inspiration and wanted to try coding for themselves, or a mix of both. But the simple gameplay and minimal assets required to make a game like Five Nights at Freddy's was evidently extremely appealing for aspiring game creators all over. So yeah. That's what we're gonna talk about. Really? All that setup and that's the segue you go with? Yeah, I'm counting that as one insult. We could sit here for hours and hours going over hundreds of FNAF fan games, because believe you me, there are enough of them to choose from. But for the sake of streamlining such a broad topic, we're gonna talk about a select amount of fan games that all fit into three different categories. Some of the earliest ones ever made, some of the most popular ones, and finally, some lesser known fan games that could do with more spotlight. But since I'm gonna be stuck in this room for a while, it sure is a good thing that I got sent all these amazing products by manscaped.com this video is sponsored by manscaped.com manscaped offers the best tools and liquid formulations for your body they hooked me up with this all-in-one performance package 4.0 check it out it's got the lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer with waterproof trimmers and advanced skin safe technology they even sent this wireless nose and ear hair trimmer deodorant and look for a limited time you can get all this plus two free gifts the shed travel bag and boxer briefs so go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off, plus free international shipping, plus two free gifts when you use promo code LSMARK at checkout. Now that's a lot of pluses.
And thanks to Manscaped.com for sponsoring this video. So without further ado, let's begin with one of the earliest Five Nights at Freddy's Final Games ever made. Alright, what's first? Five Nights at Treasure Island. Now, while these days it may be best known for holding the title as the first ever Five Nights at Freddy's fan game, well, aside from it technically being the first hugely popularized fan game, less so the very first to, you know, be actually be posted to the internet, it holds a lot more importance to its name as more or less the best encapsulation of the era of fan games it was released during, back in December of 2014 by Anart1996. Oh yeah, I remember this game. I avoided it at all costs for the longest time. I remember whenever I was a kid, I was really terrified of the Markiplier thumbnail. Oh, really? Oh yeah, Creepypasta is based on cartoons scared the fuck out of me for the longest time. I was one of those kids who find this image of Squidward scary. Well, I guess this is a better time than ever to finally check it out. Five Nights at Treasure Island has you sitting alone in the office space in the titular abandoned Treasure Island. And if you've played Five Nights at Freddy's before, you know the drill. Survive the night by checking the cameras and trying to fend off what's coming to kill you. Except in this case, instead of killer animatronic animals, it's evil distorted versions of your favorite Disney characters. Most notably, this negative color version of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> everybody. Personally, I would have found it cooler to actually have a creepy mascot costume roaming the halls, but I understand the regular Mickey model was probably easier to find. Honestly, for the time it came out, this game looks pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't know if impressive is the right word I'd use there. Given the overabundance of cheap, poorly made garbage fan games that admittedly were getting shoveled into the masses at the time, Treasure Island was definitely at the very least visually competent, at least for my liking, though god does it just not hold up graphically for me. The thing as a whole does nothing but give off just this blank blanket, grungy, ugly vibe littered with muddy dark spots and unappealing models, lighting and textures that, while giving the demo a distinct quote-unquote charm, hardly does much in terms of actually getting me to want to look at the damn thing. Yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe I was just giving it too much credit because when I hear FNAF fan game, the first thing my mind jumps to is shitty MSP and Dead to Sonic the Hedgehog or Chuck E. Cheese. But yeah, now that you mention it, it does look extremely dull. I guess a part of the challenge is trying to frantically look for the danger coming towards you, but I think the original FNAF does a much better job, through its use of harsh shadows and silhouettes. Much better from a gameplay perspective. Saying that though, for the time it was made, it's still pretty impressive to me that one guy was able to make all of this. And who knows? Maybe sometime he'll use the skills he acquired from working on Treasure Island to make something of a better quality someday. I mean, for sure, who knows? While this thing ain't much to look at these days, the concept alone definitely could work as a basis for something more refined and fleshed out. But as that original demo stands, it's difficult to judge as a full game, as, well, it's a demo, but for what it's worth, it's a neat little piece of history in FNAF's community that I feel like deserves a play for anybody interested in the era of fan games where the standards for good enough were practically defined by this thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you go back and look at the kind of FNAF shit people were making content about around this time, this must have been a fucking godsend. Speaking of... <laughs> I really love going back and watching Let's Plays for games like this. Imagine having to sit down and unironically record yourself pretending to get scared by MSP and backgrounds of PNG sliding around. Oh, look at that! Oh, hey, he's on my, he's on my- <gasps> Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese's settles you in with the spookiest thing known to man, a mid-high keyboard. Well, shitty default FL Studio keyboard music aside, immediately upon opening this thing up, even for a 2015 fan game, we're met with just a slew of red flags. Case in point, everything that meets you on screen. Graphically, things are a mess, with the office composed of nothing but an ugly arrangement of JPEG assets of differing image quality, mismatched image placements that works. My personal favorite is the kid whispering into the microphone telling you the epic Chuck E. Cheese backstory, trying not to let his parents hear what he's saying in the next room. Then when he realizes it doesn't sound intimidating enough, he went back and pitch shifted it to make his voice deeper. Hello. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, welcome to Chuck E. Cheese's. We're keeping you a kid. But come on, they're just a kid. Graphic design isn't exactly their forte. There's always a chance they can make up for it with the gameplay, right? Oh, Mark, I am so sorry. Wait, you're telling me Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese isn't good? This game, at least in the earlier nights, gives you a single repetitive mechanic to work with. That definitely wasn't stolen from FNAF 2. Flashing a light towards any one of the three entrances to your office to check for the existence of Chuck E. Cheese mascot PNGs. I mean, come on, I, what else is there to even say about this? I think watching a game like this really makes me appreciate the original FNAF 
even more. Because it's really presented in the most perfect way, to where, even not listening to the phone guy, you can actually use your common sense to understand what's going on, and what you have to do. Stuff like having the animatronics start at the top of the map and you at the bottom, the subtle sound cues to show them moving closer, how you can see them or their silhouettes at the door after closing it so you can quickly know if they're still there, a lot of quality of life shit that makes playing the game engaging and fun. None of that is present in Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese. You're just sort of waiting for them to show up at the doors, watching the camera isn't necessary unless you want the chance of having your posters in the room be replaced with Foxy or some anime guy. Who the fuck is this? Well, gonna be real, I can't say I feel like much else can be said for the peace love resistance that is Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese. For as much joy as our three minute experience together with this game gave me, I... Man, is this thing even worth a conclusion? What hasn't been said about low shelf fan game crap like this? Yeah, okay, you're right, what's next? This one opens on a Comic Sans title screen. Is that all you wanted me to say? Yeah. Five Nights at Warriors. Now, conceptually, a fan game with this title may help you imagine hanging around in some kind of a traditional bouncy Mario setting. You know, some kind of dangerous looking castle, a ghost house, frickin' I don't know, maybe even some kind of haunted mansion will work as a reference to Luigi's Mansion. In fact, damn, that would make perfect sense for a fan game, playing as Luigi, trapped in a room, fencing off ghosts with a couple fun gadgets. Yeah, let's grab Mario and friends and shove them in a generic abandoned warehouse. I mean, sure, none of Nintendo's IPs really scream horror, but I don't know, man, at least admit to how unorthodox an idea like combining FNAF with anything Mario related is, and go full one night of Plumpties and create some kind of tongue-in-cheek self-aware parody or something. Instead, here we get to play as some ambiguous entity fighting off laughably tame matters of Mario characters posed in rips from, probably, Source Filmmaker or something and slapped over real photos of... <coughs> Wario's Fast Food Factory. Yeah, you know, at the very least Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese actually used images of real Chuck E. Cheese restaurants. It wasn't, oh, I'm working in the Chuck E. Cheese factory, with PNGs of generic first page Google image results for warehouse. It's just so lazy. I get it was probably made by a kid, but I don't know, you couldn't even be bothered to make a simple drawing. Five Nights at Sonic's, for shit as it looks, at least has original art. Not posed models, screenshotted, and then plopped into MS Paint, then drawn over with white dead eyes and scratches. It's like, why even bother if you clearly didn't want to commit to the idea. I'd understand the shitty presentation of the gameplay did something cool or unique, but no! It's just like the rest of these fucking things. They just took Five Nights at Freddy's, put Mario characters over it, and stripped it of just about everything that made it fun to play. Look, I can't do this anymore. I can't sit here and talk about these shitty PNG games made by a kid who's just downloaded their first free trial of Game Maker. Let's get into some of the real shit. Some of the more interesting early fun games. Go Motion, what do you got? Oh, come on, Jody. I know it's not very good, but FNAF 3 is nowhere near in the level of this other shit. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 Fan Made Edition! Yeah, so back in late 2014, before the release of, uh, you know, the official game, BFB Films 424 posted simply Five Nights at Freddy's 3 to Game Jaws, confusing, pissing off, and downright insulting members of the FNAF community. Oh, wow. Someone had the balls to make their own Five Nights at Freddy's 3 and tried to trick the community into believing it was real? Damn, it must have been pretty impressive if he thought he could trick people. <laughs> yeah, right? It's made entirely by reusing using assets from FNAF 1 and 2. Oh. This thing is certainly one of the most infamous games we're bringing up here, as it did practically nothing but combine mechanics and graphics from the pre-existing official games, and gets its hands even dirtier by straight up stealing popular fan characters at the time and renaming them to pass them off as its own. I, I mean, the game is literally chock full of this, it's what makes up its very foundation. The only redeeming quality I can sorta of give is the fact that it brings back the then heavily debated toxic meter asset, what we now officially know to be a remnant of a scrapped mechanic from Five Nights at Freddy's 2 that would limit the amount of time the player would be allowed to keep the Freddy head on for. Of course, any official confirmation aside, a good chunk of the community quite correctly assumed that it would have been used for, you know, that exact purpose, and lo and behold, the fan made FNAF 3 went ahead and brought that concept to life, but other than that, yeah, no, this thing was kind of an insult to both Scott Cawthon and the community back when it was hot and fresh, so it was taken down, and rebranded as the first entry to a now heavily controversial fan game series, yeah, it all came full circle, huh? Wow, okay, there's a lot of history behind this thing. And the FNAF community is like the one community I have left where I'm drama free in, so let's quickly move on. How about this one? A fan made Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Damn. Well, this sucks. It's just a bunch of assets thrown together with barely any actual gameplay. First thing it tells me to do is not hit control, so of course I hit control, and I'm presented with. Who the fuck made this shit? They should be ashamed. What are you doing? Oh, just deducing the most legal way to murder the nearest Irishman in the vicinity for insulting my greatest gift to mankind. What do you mean? Oh, no. No, you didn't. Alright, moving on. Come on. We can't sit here all day. Pull up the next game.
Five Nights at Fuckboys. Wow, I haven't heard that in a long time. I remember watching Markiplier play through this whole thing back when it came out. Watch a lot of Markiplier, don't you? Shush. This is a notable one, for the fact that instead of just trying to be another generic clone of FNAF, it instead tackles a different genre within the FNAF universe, with that genre being RPGs. I can appreciate this game for being at least somewhat aware of how shit the concept is. It's very meme-y. It loves its weed and sunglasses and dankness, is that a word? It gives it a certain charm that, well, yeah, it may have used a little bit, I still think holds up to a certain degree. I love that all the characters on the map have the same heads but simplified tiny bodies. And while I can't speak much in terms of gameplay, I'm not much of an RPG guy so I don't know what makes a good or bad one. I can at least say that it looks fun once you get past all the grinding. Once you start to level up and grow your party, it looks like you could have a fun time blasting through it. Yeah, for sure. And though, even as somebody who hardly touched the series back in the day, the impact it had on the FNAF community was inbound, spawning such frivolous community in jokes as No Puppet Man, That's Illegal, Inhale My Dong, Enragement Child, and other fun phrases to repeat to your elders. That's to say, the racing of FNAF B was certainly one of its strong points, as crude as it may have been, right? I, I mean, it had to have been. I mean, hell, I'm saying this and I never played the thing. That's gotta speak for volumes, right? Definitely, yeah. I think something like this really goes to show the creativity in the fan base that they could take something like a simple point-and-click horror game and use its characters to create a comedic turn-based RPG. And who knows? This may have even been so impactful that I wouldn't be surprised if Scott Cawthon took it as a sign to start inserting more comedic elements into the series, which he started leaning into a lot more of his own RPG FNAF world and such a location. I mean, honestly, at this point, I don't think that'd be too out of the blue considering how much Scott is embracing the fandom with his announcement of the fanverse, where he was literally funding and helping to publish a select few fan games. Definitely. I think the main thing we can take away from looking at some of the earliest fan games is, most of them are shit, but shit for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you'd get a game where you can see a solid idea, like with Five Nights at Treasure Island, but it's clearly being held back by inexperience in graphic design or game design. Some embrace their shittiness and try to do something entirely new with the formula, creating an experience that, while may not be up there gameplay-wise, more than makes up for it through other aspects such as the writing, like Five Nights at Fuckboys, and some of them are just shit. But... No, but they're just shit, and of. So I think it'd be cool now to see just how much they were able to evolve from this. I want to see the best of the best, some of the most popular FNAF fan games there are, to see just how they were able to push this franchise by providing their own spin on it. Let's take a look, starting with... Now I barely know anything about Five Nights at Candy's. I remember around the time this game was getting big I saw a video of Mark uh, some random YouTuber playing it, and I didn't give a shit at all. It actually annoyed me more than anything, because I didn't like the idea that someone was just ripping off the original FNAF and getting attention for it. Obviously I don't give a shit now, and I'm able to finally look at the game in a new light, because this game is honestly extremely impressive at how close it was able to match the quality of the original FNAF. And that is precisely one of the biggest reasons the game got so friggin' popular in its heyday. Five Nights at Candy's is, for sure, one of the most standout popular fan game franchises, contrary to how generic things may seem at face value. After all, even just looking at the first entry, while perhaps not on par to a T, the amount of polish that that thing boasts as standing against the ocean of Game Jolt's FNAF tribute offerings around mid-2015 was enough to generate a substantial interest in FNAF, even if, at its core, it stuck dangerously close to the original game's themes, visual identity, and gameplay mechanics, only swapping out the main animatronic cast for some fresh new faces. The series' initial conception is certainly one of its most interesting qualities though, born from the popularity of the standalone Candy the Cat fan character that the FNAF community at the time just couldn't keep its grubby little hands off of, throwing the poor guy into countless low bar fan games without the creator's consent. And to partially counteract this issue, an official Five Nights at Candies was conceptualized, developed, and released to critical acclaim. Of course, yeah. I think to me that's what's so impressive about this game. With all the other shit like Five Nights at Wario's and Chuck E. Cheese's, I think it becomes obvious how almost deceptively simple the original FNAF comes across. You know, you think making a clone will be a piece of cake, but Five Nights at Candy sticks out because it's someone who actually tried to make their own version of FNAF and actually succeeded. They were able to make a FNAF game using their own fan character without stripping out of everything that made the original fun, even adding in one or two of their own unique mechanics to help it stand out, such as having the vent directly in front of you as you play, so much that it spawned its own little series with sequels and lore and whatnot. I mean, totally. The creator obviously had a good thing going with the relatively insane popularity that the first game was getting, so with what little plot and backstory he'd developed for that entry, he went on to produce another two sequels, Candies 2 and 3. That's arguably both stood just as strong as the original, still leaning into the idea of borrowing and remixing ideas, mechanics, and themes from the original Freddy's games, but doing so in perpetually abstract and interesting ways, like taking the idea of triggering audio cues throughout the vicinity of FNAF 3, and combining that with the quote-unquote office setup of FNAF 2 to create a general basis to build off of for Candies 2, or taking the idea of being trapped in your childhood bedroom, equipped with nothing but a flashlight from 4, and the one-to-one -one standoff 
standoff element between the player in Springtrap and 3, and slapping them together to create Candies 3. While these games are still flawed, there's no denying that they've all managed to hit that bar of quality again and again, with the creator even going ahead and remastering that first game to bring it up to speed with the game succeeding it. Just going to show how much of an improvement the dude's been able to demonstrate in his work over the years. Yeah, it's no surprise the guy was one of the few selected for Scott's fanverse thing. I think that also represents what's so great about fan games in general. The idea of it allowing you to get a foot in the door into the world of game development. And hey, if people see potential, then who knows? You may end up getting to work with the guy who influenced you so heavily. It'll be cool to see what other fan games manage to reach this level of quality. One Night at Flimpties is a weird one to me. I love its presentation so much. Instead of going for shitty Photoshop edits or basic three-dimensional models, instead feature some really nice looking 2D illustrated artwork. I think that was a good call. Why have something that looks super simple and generic when you could give your product a completely different style of its own? Play to your strengths, you know? Yeah, it's honestly such a refreshing take on the FNAF series and especially a huge breath of fresh air in the then samey ass sea of repetitive visual garbage that did exist in the fan game scene at the time. One Night at Flumpties, the first game at least, gameplay-wise is nothing short of as basic of a FNAF clone as you can get, there ain't no dodging around that. Yeah, even I beat it on my first try, and I suck at these games. It ends up having the same issue that the first FNAF has, where all you really need to do is keep your camera on the Foxy clone, and keep checking the doors over and over, then closing it if they're near. It tried to add a bit of challenge when it comes to this clown fella in the middle, where if you check the cameras too much he comes and kills you, but I didn't even know this was a thing until halfway into the night and still had no problems with it. I mean true, dumping the contents of the entirety of your fan game's offerings into a single bout is gonna find establishing each mechanic the game will throw you tricky, but honestly, I think Flumpty's kind of excels in using that fact that its gameplay is so one and done as one of its core strengths in creating what I'd argue to this very day is the single best parody fan game out there. This thing does not take itself seriously in the slightest. Case in point, the goddamn beaver hanging out in the shadow waiting to dash down the hallway to you with knife feet. I, can you tell this game pokes fun at the entire concept of FNAF clones? Like Mark mentioned though, it's short as hell. Get lucky on your first playthrough and that's a 10 minute completion time. It definitely is short and sweet romp that knows what you came for, gives it to you across the span of one night, parentheses, level, parentheses, and understands that you've played through the thing once, you don't really need to be dragged through another four rounds of the dang thing. I can appreciate that for sure, yeah. And I gotta say, it made me leave the experience pleasantly surprised, because of how short and easy it was, I don't think I'd ever want to return to it, but I definitely had fun playing it while it lasted. Well, I mean, if you do want a little more challenge, there is a newly updated version of the game with a hard mode. Nah, moving on. Popko sucks. That's a little mean, don't you think? Well, it's true. I had no real clue what to expect going into Popko's. It was a name I had heard being thrown around a lot in the fandom, so I figured it would be like Candies in some way. Just a solid initial game that sparked a lot of intrigue. But I'm not sure if it's just because I went in with high expectations or if I'm being too judgmental towards a fan game, but the original game at least is kind of shitty. <laughs> Ambitious for sure, but I did not have fun playing it in the slightest. So you're not in a security room this time. You're in the main stage showroom with the animatronic sitting right behind you. That's kind of a cool concept to know your killers are constantly looming over your shoulder. But then on top of that, there's a vent above you, doors to your side, a panic meter you gotta keep track of by looking out a window, and it's just way too fucking much to process. Again, simplicity. I can appreciate the creator wanting to do something new and creative, but instead of throwing in 50 different ideas and mechanics, how about just focus on one or two solid ones, and are finding them to the point where your player is aware of what they need to do at all times, without needing to write a list of notes beside them as they play, to make sure they're keeping track of all they gotta do. Yeah, I've gotta agree with you on all that, Mark. Everything you've just said is pretty much why the community is so indecisive about the game as a whole. What the original Pop Goes does do well, it really commits to, like its world building and lore and the unique concepts it brings to the table, such as, like you said, situating you in the same starting room as your antagonist and, most notably, 3D printed animatronics. Which is a dumb idea, by the way. Yeah, anyways, well, sure, elements of that original title are flawed, a lot of niche details and aspects that do get established here, and across its many scrapped ideas, games, and concepts, are still prime material for creating something potentially really cool with all the kinks ironed out, of course. Which, several years later, is exactly what they did by dismissing all previous official Pop Ghost content, deeming it all non-canon, and kicking things off fresh once again with a full-on reboot, with things already looking promising with a three-hour teaser game and countless updates and teaser images for the main course to boot by the name of Pop Goes Evergreen. Yeah, that's right, this is another fan game that ended up being poached for Scott's fanverse thing. Hopefully the added production value and more time being spent on this entry means that it can be an enjoyable experience. Can't really say so far, as all I've seen is this new design which just looks like Freddy's slimmer cousin, but you never know. Alright, what's next?
joy of creation aims to take Five Nights at Freddy's into the third dimension. You know, the actual third dimension, not just this tin con shit that Scott loves so much. Apparently, there are a lot of versions of this game out there, like one where you gotta fully walk around a house with the animatronics chasing you down, but I wanna focus on the one that I played for this video, the joy of creation story mode. This shit is fucking terrifying, to me at least. The whole concept for this game is pretty similar to FNAF 4 in a way. What if the animatronics were in your house? And I think that visually, this game does an excellent job at building up the tension and atmosphere. In the first level, you're a child laying in their cot, with each of the animatronics trying to get into your room from a different direction, with you having to do something different to fend them off whenever you see them, such as closing the curtains when you see Freddy outside and shit like that. Making it actual 3D does a lot in my opinion to enhance the fear factor. You can properly see where everything is placed in relation to you. It's a similar feeling to FNAF 3 and Help Wanted to me. When you see that the vent's entrance to your office is right at your foot, it makes you truly feel trapped. It can be argued that the gameplay might be a tad repetitive or simple, really all you're doing is remembering what to do when you see each animatronic, but the visuals do a lot to bring up the overall experience, I think. I don't know, what do you think, Gomotion? Y y you agree with me because I'm always correct, right? Mm, joy of creation is stupid. Could you, could you, could you speak up? I said the joy of creation is stupid. And I'm counting that as insult number two. Well, okay, there's like absolutely zero doubt in my mind that to jock in each game in the series is for sure astonishingly well made for a free FNAF fan game, complete with standout visuals, appropriately spooky atmospheres, and clearly solid gameplay. It's one of the most popular fan games for a reason, right? But all that is to say that, man, it just ain't my cup of tea. When you've been a part of this whole FNAF thing for as long as I have, sure, it's easy to appreciate when these things do get it right, but that sure as how also makes it easier to point out just the weirdest shit, such as the arguably very strange plots of this thing involving you quite literally spending five nights at Scott Cawthon's house fending yourself off from all his FNAF creations that have come to life and want to skin you with a rusty chainsaw or something, I don't know. Maybe it's a little difficult to explain here, but when so much of FNAF's modern day fan game offerings are all generally fairly good, the weak spots are definitely amplified for me, and I can't say FNAF coming to life and actually trying to kill you makes for a game I can really take that seriously? Wow, okay, sure, just like shit over everything I had to say, why not? You literally asked me to give you my opinion. Yeah, but not if your opinion was different to mine. That's it, Gomotion, this isn't gonna work, God. You can't be my co-security guard anymore. I was a security guard? What? I just now decided you were. That's it, this is over. Leave. Go on, get out of here. Don't you see I don't need you anymore? Alright then, bye, you little stinky bitch. I need a new co-host. Hello? Yeah, I heard you were looking for a co-host. Yeah, sure, why not? Alright, so for this section, I think it'd be fun to cover some hidden gems in the FNAF fan game community. A handful of games that don't get talked about nearly as much as the others, but deserve some recognition for what they were able to accomplish, starting with the web of cogs and oil. Yeah, this game. It's definitely one of the most straightforward FNAF fan game experiences one could have, booting you directly into the level select screen as soon as the game starts up, and presenting pretty much everything it's got to offer in one go. A selection of four bite-sized minigames, each with the player situated in some variation of what one might constitute as a spooky location, facing off against some of the lesser known faces of the Freddy's universe. It's short, but sweet. Just totally cutting the ball crap of throwing you straight into the action, moving you from gameplay snippet to gameplay snippet, and it's great. It's a great fan game that doesn't drag anything out and gets you straight into the action. Yeah, that's actually a perfect idea for a FNAF game. A short minigame collection with each mission containing a simple, easy to understand mechanic, such as being stuck in the freezer with a corpse, with you needing to turn a crank to keep the lights on, while making sure the room remains at the right temperature, or sitting in a child's room with a creepy client trying to kill you, so you have to try and keep your torch on it. Reminds me of the plush baby game mode from Help Wanted a lot. And with it not directly using the main recognizable Freddy cast, it allows the game to stand out from the crowd and almost be its own thing entirely. You know, I actually think that this would be the perfect way to go about making a game based on those Frazbear Frights books. They all contain a collection of three mini-stories each, taking place in the FNAF universe. I'd love to see them try and adapt some of those into quick little mini-games. You know, except for the Springtrap Vore story, I don't, I don't even see a visual representation of that. <coughs> so anyway, <clears throat> the web of cogs and oil. While there sure isn't much to this thing, it does what it sets out to do well and executes it near perfectly. I can't say I could recommend this enough to anybody wanting a short, compact fan game to go at for half an hour. Couldn't agree more. See how much more simple this is without someone trying to argue with me all the time?
Here's another interesting one, Super FNAF, a game that once again tries to break out the Five Nights at Freddy's universe into some other genres, with it being a 2D side-scrolling adventure puzzle game. Now, I personally think that all Scott Coffin's attempts at making a FNAF 2D platformer field miserably. Ironic or not, Freddy and Space in the Rainbow minigame suck, they're shit. So I'm curious as to how this compares. Super FNAF deviates from the idea of any traditional platformer. Sure, by definition, the game does boast some platforming elements here and there, but at its core, it's a much richer experience when it comes down to the detective work you're doing. Talking to different NPCs, and ravaging through rooms to find key items and the likes, even talking you through a series of intermittent flashback scenarios, having you play through abstract FNAF 3 minigame-esque style sequences, for example. Now, boiling these elements down, there isn't much Super FNAF does do wildly different from your standard adventure puzzle romp, as far as gameplay is concerned, but I would argue the main appeal for this thing has to be its presentation. The game is polished, with that classic low bitrate SNES sound that lasts through the OST, and the 16-bit inspired graphical style. Sure, none of these game core elements are too unique to itself, but it's the concept of combining all these ideas into a two-hour FNAF fan game that I truly think does it justice. For sure, it at least stands out among the other FNAF games we've covered today. I would actually like to see someone try their hand at a proper Five Nights at Freddy's platformer though. I'm curious how well that would work. But yeah, there's not much else to say. These are more general overviews than proper reviews, because you should probably go and check these out for yourself if it interests you enough. And with that, let's move on to our next game. Okay, so this one I have zero knowledge of. You're gonna need to fill me in on this. I had a really good time playing Porkchop's Adventure. You begin the game under the clear-cut premise of having been trapped in your work building, locked in after hours, with only Wonderworld, a new adventure, to tide you over till help arrives. A relatively beefy 2D side-scroller where you play as Porkchop, rescuing his friends from peril in a total of three worlds. Oh wow, that's like exactly what I was talking about wanting with the last game. Yep, for sure. This game does act as a legitimate platformer, packed with its own diegetic soundtrack, power-ups, side quests, miscellaneous optional content, the works. But what makes this game stand out is the fact that it's actually a first-person point-and-click survival horror, featuring an overarching puzzle element that will grant you one of the several endings if you manage to complete it. And that's just the thing about Pork Chops, it's essentially two games in one, which sure, say what you will about shoving a platformer and a survival horror flick together, but in doing that arises the opportunity for some incredibly interesting gameplay scenarios and scares. Not to mention the replayability potential here, with specific endings derived from playing through the side-scroller and coursing through the vicinity you're bound to. It's kind of insane. For sure, this game seems awesome. I love its aesthetic so much. Visually, it's superb. Everything looks so old and grimy. Again, it's wild how some of these fan games manage to look better than the official stuff Scott was putting out. That's what I've loved the most about taking this deep dive in some of the games from this community. From an outsider's perspective, the FNAF community gets written off a lot, as a bunch of weird little kids and furries who really want to fuck Freddy Fazbear, but it reminds me a lot of the Sonic fan base. And that beyond that stereotype, there are a fuck ton of wildly creative people who are getting their first hand experience with game development. And it'll be great to see just what they can make once they start to grow and improve at their craft. Wouldn't you agree, Daco? Daco? Yeah, sorry, mate. My shift was only for an hour. I'm gonna go and get hype for security breach now. Have fun, everybody! Bye bye! Oh. Go motion? <sighs> go motion, come back. What? Look, I'm sorry for yelling at you, but, you know, we gotta talk about Five Nights at Freddy's fan games. You like Five Nights at Freddy's, right? I, I, what? D no, I'm not doing this anymore. You're, you're mean. And a big dick. Well, what if we talked about Five Nights at Treasure Island again? You have that Mickey Mouse looking guy over on your channel who tried to kill you. Surely talking about his game again overthrows your feelings towards me. Alright, uh, fine. Yay. So yeah, the guy who made the original Five Nights at Treasure Island all the way back then, actually went ahead and created a remake that released back last year, and I think that it's the perfect representation for what I was talking about before, with wanting to see these people grow and get better at their craft over time, because in every single way this is 10 times better than the original. At its core, gameplay-wise, things are kept pretty similar, adhering to the same general idea. Being stuck in a room at the abandoned Treasure Island, with demonic, creepy Mickey Mouse characters hunting into attack, but even simply glancing at this thing, it's easy to tell how big of an improvement this thing's had, like, 
the visuals alone have had a huge graphical overhaul. Oh yeah, it looks so much more visually pleasing. And by pleasing, I mean unpleasing because it's a horror game. It's much easier to see the enemies coming for you. The lighting does a way better job at giving it a creepy atmosphere. I love the room full of TVs that can occasionally turn every screen to the old Mickey Mouse cartoon logo, as Suicide Mice is released out of it. These little minigames are also super cool. They finally do something with the fact that these are supposed to be mascot costumes, with you needing to shine your light in them before entering the room. It's just wild to see how much care and passion was put into this thing for being made so long after the original game's release. I mean, most creators out there would probably want to ignore their cringeworthy creations they made when they were just starting out, never mind revisiting it to make it something genuinely great. Yeah. Again, this has really been a huge eye-opening experience in realizing just how passionate and talented the Five Nights at Freddy's fan base is. And despite recent controversies, I still think it's cool that Scott Cawthon was willing to embrace them, and recognize this talent instead of pushing them away. And thank you, GoMotion, for joining me on this endeavor. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs> yeah, I'm never coming back. Bye. It's only 2 a.m.? Fuck. Well, I guess there's only one thing left to do to occupy myself.